Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hello, Ryan. How are you? I'm great. It was so good to see you in New York recently. Uh, so what you're referring to is the fact that I had to go to New York for the day job and you're upset that I didn't have time to so, to take a two and a half hour <laughs> subway ride deep into Brooklyn, almost to the point where you're no longer in New York City and uh, see you for half an hour before I took two and a half hours back to where I was staying. Is that is that what you're referring to here on the pod? Yeah, that's an, I would have I would have met you for a, a quick a quick glass of natural wine. I, uh, no, I asked you w- whether you were around, and you said, uh, uh, "Come to my house to record the podcast in person." Why, why do we need to do that? I'm looking right at you. I, I also that means I would have had to pack my fancy mic. It, true. it, it made no sense. I mean, it would have been. I think it would have been nice to to, to show listeners that. Uh, it, you know, most people think we record this in person. By I the mean, way. it is kind of weird that we've <laughs> never done it in person. I know. I've only done it in person with with Chase, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we all saw how that went. <laughs> um, but Ryan, what are we talking about today here on the podcast here in our remote studios? We're talking about bookstores. We're talking about some of our favorite bookstores to, to visit when traveling. Yeah, bookstores that are kind of themselves destinations, things that worth traveling for. And then I think we're also going to mention some of our kind of, especially in, in New York, some of our local favorites we want to make sure people check out. Yeah, yeah. I think we're we're definitely going to talk about some of our local favorites. I've noticed that you keep expanding the Manhattan section. Uh, well, I just added one. Yeah. Um, but Ryan, before we get to to bookstores, uh, we've got uh, just a, a tremendous, a huge update on the quest for Rick Steves. We have booked Rick Steves, and he's coming on the podcast. <laughs> so. Uh, Ryan, you know the the quest for Rick Steves for, right. for any new listeners is uh, we've been uh, d- d- spending a long time uh, trying to get Rick Steves to come here on the podcast. Big fan uh, of of the the Rick as I like to call him, and uh, I don't think I've ever called him that on the pod, but I, I think it, it is catchy. <laughs> and um, I've been in touch with his people for for well over a year. A year ago, got uh, the 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 not a thumbs up, but uh, you know a thumb out. From uh, from one of his PR people who said he's very busy in 2019, but be sure to check back for 2020. And I wrote back and I said, when would you like me to check back? She said, end of 2019. So I emailed when last we left, I had emailed uh, the our, my friend there, Mary, uh, the PR person at Rick Steves. And, uh, you know, I think Thanksgiving kind of slowed down uh, the response time. And I've, I've just gotten the response. <laughs> right. Um, but not from Mary though. I was just imagining Mary at her at Thanksgiving dinner and she gets an email from you and she, <laughs> she just says, excuse me to her, her 97 year old grandfather to, to walk out and just respond really quick. Cause that's so important to her that, that a, a maniac she gets back to you. continues to email me. <laughs> well, this time I got answered by a new person, a uh, Haley. Haley, uh, seems to be maybe lower down. Rick has um, a big team over there. Oh yeah. I think he yeah. employs like 50 people. Wow. And, um, this is Haley, a public relations uh, associate. And um, now Mary's title, oh, Mary's title was just PR. Um, so I'm not sure whether, but associate suggests to me maybe slightly junior member. Now I'm hoping maybe the request didn't get to Mary um, because this is the message I got back. Hi, Kiernan. Thank you for reaching out to Rick for an interview on your podcast, Out of Office. While Rick wishes he could fulfill many of the requests he receives, Uh unfortunately, he's busier than ever in 2020 and will not be able to participate in an interview. Rick asked me to thank you (laughs) for the kind invitation, and he appreciates that you thought of him. Keep up the great work, and thank you for covering important and extremely relevant topics on your podcast. Wow. Wow. Oh, so there's can, a lot to pick apart here, Ryan. Um, is, is, wait, wait, is that a is, wait? Is that a pull quote we can use? Uh, <laughs> Cover is important and extremely relevant. Well, slash Rick the, Steves you, PR you, flag. <laughs> you, you, you've jumped uh, to to a really important portion, which suggests that she took the time. Haley took the time to listen to a few episodes of the pod. Respects right. the re- extremely rel- the important and extremely relevant topics that we're covering here today. So to me, I agree with you. I think that is a full throated endorsement from yeah. Rick Steves. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's the debatable premise that Rick asked her to say, thank you. I mean, listen, I, I appreciate the, the spin 
Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm choosing. I'm, I had, when I got this, Ryan, I felt like we we could go in one of two directions, right? right. We could say the quest is over. Um, we could say it's a failed quest. It's right. been a year. Uh, you know, we we had that episode, the love letter for Rick Steves. Mm, I thought I, that I would remember, surely. I remember that one. Yeah. And and well, I hope you would remember. <laughs> well, it's like Sixty two episodes. It's not. <laughs> and um, but in and, and we could throw in the towel. But I, you know, I think that one of the strengths of, of you and I are that we we persevere. Like, like, wow, airlines, we're going to keep fighting. That's right. We are going to come back stronger than ever. And I think, you know, it's, it's like, it's the hero's journey at the heart of any great narrative, mm-hmm. heart of any mm-hmm. quest. Sometimes you need the, the hero. It needs to look hopeless. It needs to look like this is absolutely never going to happen before the her, the hero, the, the you and me, we rise up and we win Rick Steve's heart and butt here in the seat in the studio, in the podcast, we get Rick Steves to come on for an interview. I agree. I think we have to, I think we have to keep going for it. I think we, this, this only said about 2020, it makes no mention yeah. of Rick's schedule in 2021. <laughs> totally. and, 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 and beyond. I mean, they may want to book us for 2023. <laughs> yeah. I will take that. We're going to be here. We're doing this podcast weekly. And so, you know, I feel like I've exhausted the official channels, the like official PR at Rick Steves Europe. And so uh, it's time to get unconventional on this quest. Uh, I've got some some plots in the work. I've got some strategies I'm working on. But I welcome input from you, Ryan, from any yeah. listeners that have ideas about how we could get. Because I feel that these requests are not getting to Rick himself. And that is where this is falling apart. Do you think we could make some memes? Like we could do the the uh, Love Actually meme with the, uh, uh, oh, you know, hey, Rick, will I you come that. on? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And it's very Christmassy. Yeah, yeah very Christmassy. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I it's funny because uh, Rick Steves actually has a, a Christmas uh, special, cr- cr- Rick Steves European Christmas. Right. And uh, to me, this this rejection was just so out of keeping with the holiday spirit. Is that just him dressed as Santa Claus getting pickpocketed all around Europe? <laughs> Because that would he's be only amazing. Been I'd watch that once, Ryan. He's uh, only that he's told us about. <laughs> and I even referenced that in my email to his people to let them know what fans we are. The fact that we have a recurring right. segment. Oh, I'm sure that I'm sure his lawyers will love to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we are redoubling down on the quest. This is just uh, this is a minor setback. This firm no is just a minor setback. <laughs> and I still feel hopeful that in 2020, we will secure Rick Steves. We will complete this quest. All right. Well, I, uh, I, 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 I think that you are a worthy adversary for Haley and the rest of the PR shop. There <laughs> Not an adversary. <laughs> I'm just a friend <laughs> I'll, I'll, that they don't know they've yeah, made yeah, yet. Yeah. Fair enough. Ryan, with that, I think it's time for us to, to go out and maybe buy some, some new Rick Steves guides to support the business uh, in our favorite bookstores. I think it's time to take off. Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, Ryan. So, you know, oftentimes when we do these kind of listy theme episodes, we go in depth on just like a, a small number of places that we recommended. What I'm going to suggest here is that first at top, we talk about why we like bookstores. Like right. why, why are these places? I think a lot of people would go, you know, I can buy a, a book on Amazon uh, and, uh, it, you know, it comes in two days yeah. and, and, and uh, I can get anything. I can get any book out there on Amazon. I downloaded my Kindle instantly. So why, why are bookstores even relevant? Yeah, well, well, I, I, I hope that you and I are going to push back against that because we we like to go to bookstores. <laughs> well, the, the, the episode would be pretty short if we choose not to. <laughs> yeah, and then I if thought we would just we would... recommend the Amazon Prime delivered to your campsite. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought a lot of Easter eggs for our loyal <laughs> listeners here. And and then I thought we would just go uh, a few cities, mostly in the United States, a couple overseas, because of course you do get a little less out of bookstores when you, you know, can't read the language when you're traveling uh, for you and me in non-English speaking countries. Um, and we'll recommend specific spots that you should definitely put on your uh, travel itinerary when you visit, visit those cities. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think that sounds like a good way to do this. Now, you are very passionate about books as accessories. <laughs> so, you know, some like women carry around purses, uh, uh, you know, uh-huh, men wear uh-huh. like chains and watches. Ryan right. likes to have a, a, a big tome tucked directly into his uh, arm 
and he kind of walks around parading <laughs> it about, making sure that everybody sees the <laughs> thickness and girth of the tone. I think that that's unfair. Uh, I, I often read short stories. Uh, they don't have to be <laughs> tomes. Uh, but I, you know, it is true that I'm, you know, guilty as charged that I'm, I'm, I'm always reading a book. <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> you are always carrying around a book. You like to be perceived as somebody who reads massive amounts. Right, right. Well, I don't know about, I don't know how I'm perceived, but uh, the, the, <laughs> it is certainly uh, practical for me to carry the books with okay, me. Okay, but pony up here. Do you actually read all the books you carry around or do you just like browse them? No, I, I finish probably uh, 70% of books I start. <laughs> Although, okay. although, so we no, can wait, wait, assume wait, wait, that, wait, that, wait. that that's a little inflated. So uh, it's more like 50. <laughs> so Ezra Klein says one of the first things about being an adult reader is understanding you don't have to finish everything you read. Mm. So if you're, if you're reading something and it's like, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're not getting through it. It's not, it's not, it's not fun to read. You're not learning what you thought you'd learn. You can put that aside because there's always how many more books are on your to read list. So right, that's, right, that's right. what I try to take. I try to keep, keep that philosophy uh, alive. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you, and you, you prefer a physical copy of a book. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I won't read a book on a, uh, any kind of like electronic device. That's not pleasant. That's like, you know, it feels like work, right? It's like, am I reading a book or am I looking at a PowerPoint? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So do you not use a Kindle at all? I, I don't use a Kindle or at all. And, incomparable. And, and I understand that, that folks like that Kindles are, uh, you know, they don't have distractions like the internet. They don't have pop-ups, blah, blah, blah. I get all that, but it still feels like it's hard for my brain to make the distinction between I, I should engage with this the way I engage with a day-to-day -day work PowerPoint or a, like a, like a, you know, Russian novel. Sure. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and so uh, you, you, you actually suggested this episode of bookstores. So tell me a little bit about what is it about bookstores that you find, you know, worthy of your time when you're traveling? Well, I think the bookstores uh, and, and all these are obviously independently owned bookstores. We're not going to say go to the, go to no, the, we're not. the, the Barnes, the Barnes and, Noble and Noble and yeah, Union and, Square or whatever. <laughs> right. uh, uh, so, so bookstores are, uh, they're independent, they're local, uh, so that you actually, when you, when you get there, you, you have like a feel of, of what's going on in the local art scene. Often you can grab like the alternative weekly paper or some kind of like event listings or sort of, it becomes sort of like an outpost for what's happening in, in sort of the local art space, queer space, you know, uh, kind of alternative space. Uh, so that's like a cool thing that bookstores offer. Often they'll have you know, kind of random events. You'll, you'll, you'll have uh, people on book tours, you'll have uh, panels and all sorts of things. Uh, there's a lot of great bookstores that, you know, I was just in LA recently and I just walked in a bookstore and I, I, for 15 minutes, just watched some guy talk about his travels in Cuba. He was there pitching one of his, his travel books. I should have gotten him <laughs> to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for skipping that. <laughs> in retrospect. Uh, so, you know, so it, it, you know, I, I think they're sort of lively local places. And when you're trying to get, when you're a tourist, you don't have a lot of time to sort of get to know a place. It's a great way to sort of immerse yourself in people who live there. Yeah. And I think this has really been borne out where, uh, even in the age of Amazon, uh, independent bookstores have actually seen an increase in their popularity and sales. And it's because folks have uh, come to realize, I know I've certainly realized in here in Somerville where I live that the, the local bookstore, it becomes almost like a center of the community. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes, it becomes a center of, of, uh, yeah, it's a community space. Absolutely. Uh, so, sort of in the way that libraries are and, 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 uh, but it's with like a more kind of hip independent feel less, you know, you less have to, you don't get shushed as much at a, at a bookstore. <laughs> no, well, I, actually I shush people a lot, in bookstores, <laughs> but that, I, I like to approach them as libraries. No, absolutely. Yeah. That's actually an interesting, uh, distinction. So why is, doesn't a library get the same love as we give to bookstores when we travel? Well, I think there are some great libraries, and I, we, we've talked about them b before. Um, but so many libraries are, you know, they're they're kind of, they feel like you're in in a, a DMV with books, right? I mean, we have beautiful yeah. libraries in New York. <laughs> right, in right, New York, right. there, there are beautiful libraries in Mexico City. I've been to fantastic libraries, um, but but often, like my local library, growing up, mm. it was not like a play. It was it was I loved going there, and there were some tables and chairs, but it, it wasn't like a space that you were like. I want to spend the afternoon just lounging here and drinking coffee. They didn't, right, they, right, they didn't right. have coffee. I'm sure you weren't allowed to drink there. You know, <laughs> anything they could do to make it feel a little more unpleasant. And yeah, it's, it's, me, harder, were... it's harder to lounge at the water fountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think there are two more reasons that I can think of that I really like bookstores when traveling. The first is 
if you're like me and you're packing your schedule and you just have so many like uh, uh, attractions that you're trying to get to, you're trying to get to a show or a museum, a, a bookstore offers a great place to, to kind of relax and spend an hour or two um, without uh, feeling the, the kind of rush to get through it. So it can feel uh, familiar in that you're seeing, you know, books that you've considered, things that you want to add to your list, but it's also uh, an attraction unto itself. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it is a, a kind of place to unwind for a little bit, let your brain sort of get out of the hustle and bustle of travel and just kind of browse and think. Um, it's also a great, this is a, one of my favorite things to do when I'm trying to kill time in, in, in New York or any city though. You know, you can, if you can, you can stop by a bookstore and an hour can go away uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so there are great places to sort of buffer your, your sort of more intense travel trips. And then uh, finally, I often, even even when I'm not like really in the market for a book, I will buy a book that has been on my reading list for a long time just to support the local independent bookstore. And so it's a great excuse to like uh, basically get to that list of things you've been meaning to, to get to, buy a nice edition, add it into your suitcase. It becomes a bit of a souvenir, but, you know, and, and certainly most books are going to fit those three P's of a great souvenir. Now, Ryan, you remember those three P's, right? Uh, yes, I, I, I do. Absolutely. Portability. Portability is one, right? A book, usually pretty small, it, it flat, fits right in the suitcase. That's, that's one P. I mean, maybe the books you read, I, my, my, the books I read are thousands of pages and, and not <laughs> convenient for travel. <laughs> They're not even convenient to, to <laughs> carry around. That's why you yeah. got one giant bicep and one yeah. little wimpy lettuce. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> uh, 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 I would say that, pre- oh, God, not prestige. What is, uh. <laughs> Price? Price, price is price is one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know most books aren't going to break the bank. Uh, you, no. could, you could get even a beautiful edition for under fifty dollars. Absolutely, right. And I, I, I don't remember. It's like uh, I don't how I don't know what the P potency word. potency. What what you're I was like for meaningfulness. Yeah, yeah. And that's why often when I when I'm in an independent yeah. bookstore or that I'm visiting when I'm traveling, I will find a book that's about the place that I'm in. So, you know, maybe you're going to get a book about, uh, you know, the history of pioneers in Washington and Oregon when you're in a sure. bookstore in that area. And uh, th- I like that because it becomes more potent when you read it. It brings you back to that trip. You've learned more about the area. You put it on your shelf. You think about that trip each time that you look at that book. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and all, the, all these bookstores have local sections, which will have local historians and, and, and books that you probably haven't heard of, can't find other places. Right. Exactly. I, yes, yeah. yes, yes, exactly. So that's, uh, you know, uh, local histories, local uh, news. Uh, that you, you can often find books that don't get wide circulation that, that independent bookstores, you know, take pride in uh, having on their shelves. Yeah. And before I go on a trip to like a, a new country or, or, or even, even a place that I visited before, I, I like to read a book that's relevant to where I'm going or where I'll be. So I visit one of these bookstores uh, to buy these books. Uh, in fact, I was, just, you know, like I was just in LA and I just picked up a novel for, for Columbia this, this December. So, mm. uh, you know, I think that's something we encourage people to do as well. And it seems like you and I also, uh, probably uh, another thing that we haven't emphasized enough is how often these bookstores also have coffee. And that, you know, I think you and I both coffee lovers. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing goes better with a good book than a a (laughs) cup of coffee. Well, maybe a glass of natural wine, but you know, we'll we'll do another whole episode on wine stores. Absolutely. When I'm, when I'm done with a book, I like to dunk it right into a fresh cup of coffee. (laughs) Just sop it right between my lips. Delicious. Yeah. If I've read a book, you can tell if I'm reading and, uh, you know, I, I'll leave like coffee stains in the, in the daytime and, and wine stains at night. So you can, I you mean, can, listen, yeah. with, with you, with you, Ryan, if it's coffee and wine stains, I'm lucky. <laughs> Some of the stains I've seen in your house. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's get to the recommendation part of the episode. Now, just to, to lay a ground rule here. I think that we should probably only take a minute or two to sum up right. why we like these bookstores, because I'm not sure how interesting it is to people <laughs> to hear us describe bookstores. <laughs> right, um, right. But I think but the, we, 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 we encourage uh, listeners to share their favorite bookstores, too, though, because absolutely. I think that the, 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 there, are, there are gems in you know, almost every town. That's right. And so uh, folks can email us at outofofficepod uh, at gmail.com. That's outofofficepod at gmail.com. Tell us your favorite bookstores. Well, I'm sure we'll do a follow-up episode. Maybe I'll throw them up on the Instagram. Instagram at OOO podcast at OO podcast. Just a little different than the email. Great yeah. branding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things that I'm going to do this week on the, on the Insta is I have uh, 
pictures I've taken at every one of these bookstores that I, that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to share those on the, on the Insta because, you know, bookstores make great Instagram content. That's true. It makes people think you're highly literary. Yeah. See, Ryan yeah. likes that as a core <laughs> part of his personal brand. Oh, right, right, right. And so he, he sends out pictures of himself reading and then you ask him a question about the book and he's like, uh, uh, um, the cover is pretty, uh, that, is you know. so, that is so unfair. <laughs> Um, um, so we're going to cover, we're each going to cover uh, a couple uh, in, in the cities that we live in. So you've got a, a couple in uh, Manhattan. I've got one in Manhattan. You've got one in Brooklyn. Then I've got two that I want to talk about in Boston. And then we'll do kind of a smattering of places that we've visited, bookstores that have really left an impression. Okay. That so sounds great. why don't we start in New York? Yes. New York, the city we both know and, know and love. Absolutely. So I, I think the most famous bookstore in, in New York City um, and, and easily the largest is the Strand Bookstore. Right. And it's which, right, right, right by Union Square. Right by Union Square. And it is epic. It is what, I think it's what, four stories of, of books. Uh, they, they, their advertising and marketing is like the most miles of books of any, of any bookstore. 18 miles of books is their yeah, claim. 18, 18 miles. miles of books. And it is, an, it is an epic place. They've got new and used books. They've got uh, a, a rare book room that they host uh, events. In fact, um, Tommy Wallach, a guest of the pod, friend of the pod, uh, had one of his book launch parties at, at the Strand at one of their uh, private uh, library rooms. It's an awesome space, and it meets a lot of the criteria we've talked about. It is it is definitely a, a local place. You can you can get lots of books on on New York. Uh, you can buy all the latest sort of like uh, zines and uh, alternative news weeklies and and all that stuff. They have a lot of events. So the Strand uh, and by the way, a terrific Instagram uh, opportunities. And Ryan, I, I think you're forgetting maybe the most relevant part of the Strand, which is we. We're in the Strand together when we came up with the idea for Out of Office. Really? Yes. We were, uh, we were hanging out. We were, yeah. we were just strolling around Manhattan. We stopped in the Strand. We were talking about potentially uh, put, turning our, uh, our minds to a political podcast. Right. That's, and what then, the world, that's what the world really wanted. <laughs> well, and then we were uh, in front of the travel book section. And immediately we, we just had a great conversation. We stood there. We were pulling out books. We were talking about yeah. different places we had visited. And we realized, you know what? This is the major passion point. This is what we talk about all the time. This is where uh, there aren't great podcasts serving this space. And it was in the Strand Bookstore. It was downstairs in the travel section. That's that, that, you, you reminded me. That's incredible. Yeah, I, absolutely. So, yeah. So, so the strand is like the birthplace of out of all. That's exactly right. We so should have led with that. So absolutely. It deserves yeah. top billing here yeah. uh, in our list. Um, so the strand, you got to check out. Um, I also uh, have a, have a favorite here. It's called idle wild. I D L E W I L D. It's got two outposts, one in Manhattan, uh, one in Brooklyn. And Ryan, it it used to be right down the street from the uh, the office where you and I met in the the company Blue State sure, Digital, where we sure. both worked. And uh, I used to visit it quite often. And they specialize in travel books. Um, and my favorite part about what makes Idlewild unique is that it is uh, organized by region of the world, and they mix in travel books along with novels, memoirs, poetry, books that come from or describe the region that is in that area of the world. So. Uh, you can, if, if you're planning a trip to Paris, you can go and find, uh, you know, literary inspiration to prepare you for the trip. So I recommend when, when you've got a trip going up, go to Idlewild, you get uh, one guidebook and then pick up some sort of literary or, or fictional uh, counterpart to really get you in the spirit. Yeah, I, I remember you slipping out uh, of work early to go to Idlewild quite a bit. Absolutely. And uh, the other thing, I, wh one thing I always aspired to do there is they actually uh, teach languages there as well. That's like right. part, yeah. part, part of the business. Because, you know, a lot of these independent bookstores, yeah. they have to have a cafe. They have to have some other uh, business feeding in to keep them viable. Do you think they offer Spanish classes? So they offer French, Spanish, Italian, and uh, German. So I could, I could spend time in a bookstore and learn uh, Spanish. This might be a, a you know a good episode. Um, I think most people could learn Spanish. <laughs> I think maybe uh, you know whether you could. Wow. It, I'm not wow. sure how how amazing the teachers are. I mean, maybe maybe they maybe they could. You know, and speaking of cafes, one of the uh, one of my sort of favorite places uh, to meet a friend and have a cup of coffee is the Housing Works Bookstore uh, Cafe and Bar. Have you oh, been yeah. there? Yes, I yeah. have, and it, yeah. it supports a good cause as well. Yeah, it supports a great organization. Housing Works is basically a non-homophobic Salvation Army um, uh, that does a lot of fantastic work uh, with with the homeless and and uh, uh, folks in in New York. Um, 
So when you buy a book there or coffee there, you're supporting this organization. And it's it's a two-story bookstore. They've got a great cafe and, um, you know, it's very vibrant, super, super local. It's downtown. Uh, so it's got a good vibe. And I, I just love to, s- to spend time there and, and drink some coffee and read a book. Yeah. And that it's right at the border of like the East Village <clears throat> and Nolita area um, right. in, in New York. Uh, so right by, by Prince Street, if you happen to get down there, a lot of sort of fashion uh, uh, stores around there. Housing Works really stands out to me, too, for uh, the breadth of events that they host. I actually attended uh, The Moth uh, when it was at Housing Works. And I've even heard that people can get married there, <laughs> which, yeah. again, you, you know, to keep these places viable, you got to have all types of business, <laughs> all types of income in these independent bookstores. Um, yeah, you have to have all types of income. I, I mean, I've been to several book launch book launches at, at Housing Works that were, were lovely. You know, it's a, it's a great event space. So I, I think a wedding there, you know, I, I'll put that on my, uh, on my list of, of possible wedding venues if, uh, you know, <laughs> the day ever comes. What, what, yeah, once you meet that right person. <laughs> um, and look, we can't leave New York without me mentioning my, my local uh, uh, bookstore uh, here in Bushwick, Brooklyn, uh, Molasses Books. This is a great little independent uh, bookstore, uh, coffee shop, uh, really cool place. Uh, the owner started off uh, actually selling books uh, on on the street, like as a as a vendor, and uh, it was called Molasses. And then he just he moved down the street to an actual physical space a few years ago, and they host uh, all sorts of uh, poetry readings, book readings. They do uh, like uh, game nights. It does. They do all sorts of things there, and it's a super cute venue and uh, a lot of great books. So, do you know uh, where where the name came from? I do not know where the name came from. No. Uh, it, it, but it does, I mean, it fits, it fits, uh, with sort of the vibe. It's, it's very, it's a very Brooklyn place. Do you feel like it's, it's kind of slow? It, it is kind of slow. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no one's going in there. If you're in a hurry, molasses books is not where you grab a cup of coffee, <laughs> you know? All right, Ryan. Well, I want you to report back on why it's called molasses books. Cause I really, I like molasses and I like the name that it has a lot of personality in there. I mean, I just, I just imagine uh, Winnie the Pooh just sitting back, like, like putting some molasses on a piece of bread with a nice book by a fire. <laughs> That's the image that comes to my mind. I don't think uh, Winnie the Pooh used utensils. Um, or he just used his paw or whatever to yeah, slaughter Yeah, he just there. used his paw. All right, well, I mean, that's going to mess up the book, but whatever Winnie <laughs> wants. <laughs> yeah, um, all right. Well, so that, that covers New York. We've got, we've got four recommendations there. The Strand, which is a very uh, a famous Idlewild, which uh, is a great uh, place for anyone who listens to this podcast. Uh, Housing Works, which uh, gives you that kind of good feeling because you're, you're supporting a great cause, and it's also just a cool, interesting space. And in Bushwick, Molasses Books, Ryan's favorite local spot. Uh, I've got three I want to mention quickly in Boston. Um, as you as you mentioned, good to to mention kind of our lo- our local favorites. Mine is uh, Porter Square Books. It's in Porter Square in Cambridge, and uh, Porter Square is where I lived for a, a few years, three years. And I will say, when when Catherine and I kind of first um, found our apartment there, I was not like thrilled about the neighborhood. It has kind of like some big box stores like Dunkin' Donuts. It just, it, there wasn't a ton of personality, but then I discovered this independent bookstore, Porter Square Books, and it is absolutely the, the nerve center of Porter Square. It gives everybody a destination. So, it, you know, if you have to go to, to Star Market or Target or, you know, one of these more uh, kind of soulless places, um, you can stop into Porter Square Books, kind of reground yourself. It's right next door to a, to a local toy store. So, you know, there is this kind of um, local independent minded uh, nook that gives the personality to Porter Square. And uh, I have spent many hours uh, in window seats reading um, and talking to people next to me. I will say I prefer not to talk when I'm getting coffee at a bookstore. But, you know, it is how you engage other folks in the neighborhood. I don't know that I've ever been so so when I think of Boston, I think of I'm mean, Boston has so many fantastic bookstores. Um, I don't know if I'm I'm stepping on your toes here, but Harvard Bookstore is is yes, fantastic. Yeah, so just down yeah. the street from from Porter Square, about a twenty minute walk, you end up in Harvard Square, and there's two big bookstores in Harvard Square. One is the Harvard Co op. That's like the official run by the university uh, bookstore, and and it, there's a lot going for it. it. It's quite beautiful, but to me, it does have the feel of kind of a corporate kind of Barnes and Noble. Right. Better is the one that you're pointing out, which is the Harvard bookstore, which is, uh, just a little further down the square. And, uh, this is, uh, it, it doesn't have a cafe. It, 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 it kind of is the quintessential independent bookstore. And my favorite feature there is that on the, on the floor that you enter, 
that's where you can get all the new additions. But right. then you go downstairs and they have a huge variety of used books available down there. So often you can get kind of cut rate prices uh, for the same book you're looking at on the first floor. Uh, if you go down there and occasionally you can even get some, you know, no longer uh, uh, printed books, uh, some real treasures. Yeah, that, it, it is one of the best curated bookstores on this list, no doubt. I mean, they, they have it's. Whenever I've gone in there, I've been lost in their recommendation section because they they do they they do seem to, you know, have some cloud about. But how, because how they, because they were just too intellectually powerful for you, <laughs> you just got lost among uh, among the hard. No, I just I I mean there were just so many good recommendations. I I, I had decision fatigue and I couldn't I couldn't read any of them. <laughs> <laughs> So it might be, they might be too good at their own, uh, you know, for their own good here. And the uh, final Boston recommendation, this one is in Boston proper, but it picks up on kind of the appeal of a used bookstore. It is a uh, one block away from Boston Commons. So if you're visiting uh, the Boston Public Gardens, Boston Common, the State House, it, it would be a real shame not to go and see the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, so the Brattle Bookshop, uh, it's a, it's a real institution. It was, it's been there since 1825. And that's, it's where you can find, um, it's all used books and you can really find, uh, offbeat weird, uh, books that you've just never heard of. Uh, they're, they're by topic. And, uh, I know I like to go and uh, browse like new England history, uh, Boston history books. And I've discovered a lot of stuff there that I've just never known about the city that I live in. And, and so that's where I, I tend to spend most of my time. And, uh, it is famously, uh, run by an owner who claims that his first word was book. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's extremely quirky. It feels very old and creaky. Like it does not have any kind of, there's, there's no bells or whistles about it. It's kind of like straightforward wooden and metal shelves, books stacked every which way, and it invites browsing. So Brattle Bookstore, and in nice weather, in a lot next to it, they even open up um, like outdoor bookshelves where you can get a book for like two bucks. Oh, I, I love the outdoor, the outdoor bookshelves. The Strand does that too. You sort of just can go grab a dollar book and, and get out of there quick. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And one thing I'll include in the show notes is a, an interview that The Guardian did with the current owner of Brattle Bookshop. And uh, you can learn more about the cool history there, but definitely uh, carve time in your, in your Boston itinerary. So we've covered New York. Uh, we've covered uh, three in Boston. The three in Boston, just quickly again, Porter Square Books, Harvard Bookstore, Brattle Street Books. Now, Ren, I thought maybe we could each choose one or two uh, in other U.S. cities that we've traveled to that have really just stuck in our minds as great standout bookstores. Sure. I, I, I want to go first um, because. <laughs> OK. I know I do. I do. Because when I, I, I often there's, this, there's a couple c cities that I, 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 I'm not known for loving and Portland is one of them. Mm. And I don't know why, maybe it's because it, it hits too close to home because it's sort of like a, a bush brick of the West. And I'm just like, you know, what that's are these, true. It what is what are these, for sure. What, what are these folks trying to pull over here? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, ultimately, it's because we got yelled at because we, we went to see Paul McCartney in Portland and oh. we we stood up too much during the show. And uh, all the boomers around us constantly said, you have to sit down, you have to sit down. And I'm like, we're at a rock concert. Um, so that's what I, that's what I think of when I think about Portland. <laughs> no, Ryan, you, you're bordering on Boomer. I mean, I, I wouldn't be too, uh, too I'm a, quick. I'm a millennial, the heart, heartbeat of the millennials <laughs> is what they call me. Yeah. We all call you that. <laughs> um, but Portland does have a fantastic bookstore. I know exactly the bookstore that you're going <laughs> to, yeah. you're going to talk about. It was also uh, on my list. So I'm going to jump in and, uh, I will say, I think that this is a bookstore that many people may have seen their online presence and not realize that it is a big bookstore unto itself, a physical bookstore. Yeah, they, they, they I think to their credit, they figured out how to use the internet to market their books. That's right. Um, so, so they could they could survive. Uh, yeah, but they have a, they have a, a really solid online brand. And, uh, you know, I should actually shop at, pa at Powell's Books more often. That's right. Powell's Books. That's his, it was time yeah. for us to finally say the name. <laughs> it, it's Powell's Book, which is a, a huge, uh, a huge bookstore. I mean, it, it feels kind of infinite when you're inside of it. And it famously yeah. occupies a full city block in downtown Powell, uh, in, in downtown Portland. Yeah, it's it's absolutely massive. They have uh, nine huge color coded ro uh, rooms for each of their sections. The color coding, <laughs> I remember uh, exactly. That was like because uh, I remember it's actually so large that it's somewhat hard to navigate, and so yeah. you have to uh, the colors align with different topic areas, and and that's where you have to go. And I remember I was looking specifically for national <clears throat> park books, 
And they had some some great books I had never seen on the national parks once I once I found it. Yeah, though once you found the section, they have everything you know that's ever been published. Right. The, <laughs> <laughs> so they 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 claim to have uh, over four million books. So I don't know how that compares with the eighteen miles of books that the Strand has. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I don't know what the I mile. Don't, I don't per know book. what the mi- the book to mile <laughs> ratio yeah. is. Yeah, but it, I, either way, that's a ton of books, right? Yeah. They have basically everything you could ever imagine. I remember particularly, I liked, they had a, a, uh, a rare books uh, room that only a certain number of people are allowed in at any time. Super fun to go in and browse some of the, these great treasures. I remember they had, like <laughs> this is going to really nerd out, but I remember they had this awesome collection of Star Wars books <laughs> in oh, that wow. room. And wow. uh, I, Catherine, I could tell, was very fearful when my hands <laughs> came upon those because I was very tempted. Unfortunately... Not very price competitive. So in my three my three P souvenir framework didn't exactly fit the bill. Um, but Powell's a, a, a wonderful place to check out, and it really has that kind of Portland spirit. And, yeah, and, and so I think you're you're going to stay out west with your next recommendation, right? That's right, but uh, a little further inland. So uh, this one is uh, in Denver, and I, I find myself going through Denver, uh, you know, once or twice a year because uh, Catherine and I like to take a trip out to Colorado to ski. And uh, oftentimes that means a night or two in Denver uh, on your way out to the mountains. And Denver, um, you know, Denver doesn't, it's not packed with like awesome attractions. There are, there are a couple historic houses there. Um, there there are some, some very good restaurants. But uh, one, one of the best things to do there is uh, uh, visit the bookstore called the Tattered Cover bookstore. And it is a, a local chain, but there is uh, a, um, there is kind of the flagship store, which also is uh, uh, one city block wide. And uh, actually, weirdly with Powell's, both were founded in 1971. So it feels like maybe something in the water, but, you know, amazing long history uh, of these, these bookstores. And uh, it has a, a very kind of uh, community feel about it. It does have a, a local cafe. It also has a, a huge selection of local books about the West. And so that was something that really attracted me to it. Um, and, you know, frankly, it's just it, when, you, when, you're, when you're looking for, for ways to kill time in Denver in, in between eating great food, the tattered cover really fits the bill. And one of the fun things that I read about the tattered cover was in the year 2000, Mm-hmm. Uh, they were they were sued for failing to turn over the the book sale records of a customer to the to the police hmm. uh, who believed that he was purchasing or he or she was purchasing books uh, on manufacturing meth. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and so very Denver thing to do. Yeah, sure. And I mean, so, listen, the winters are long. <laughs> yeah, but so you know, and 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 they they had to cover. They fought, uh, and they they went all the way to the Colorado Supreme Court and won to protect uh, to protect their their customers. Wow. So, Feel free to pick up any cop, any Salinger you want over there, you know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Wow, good yeah. for them. Yeah, they, they, they will. They will. <laughs> don't ask, don't tell is a policy at that tattered book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan. And then I thought maybe, uh, you know, now that we, we've covered uh, some of our favorites in the U.S., maybe we could each pick just one from, uh, from overseas. What do you think? Okay, one from overseas. Yeah, that works. Or, or do you, I mean, do you have two? I can see oh. you see you seem to have a little glint in your eye. No, if you, no, if I, you I, want two, you can cover two. No, no, I have one. I have another one in North America. So we can go overseas, or do we want to? Do we want to stick here first? You want to cover one in Mexico City, don't you? I do. Yeah. So uh, do you want to do you want to do your pronunciation magic here? <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying it's a bookstore that you love, but that you can't pronounce the name of. Well, I I, I can. Uh, it's like cafe. I, you know, I call it a pendulo. So your recommendation is for a bookstore in Mexico City. It's called Cafe Barreria El Pendulo, but you call it just pendulo, right? Yeah, I just call it pendulo. And I think that's what most people call it. But, sure. Um, it is a, a, a bookstore that meets a lot of these requirements. It's in Mexico City. Um, it's, it's, they've got two, two floors of, of books. They've got plenty of English language uh, titles. So mm. if you have run out of things to read... Um, you can definitely go here and pick up a, a, a book or two. Um, they also have a fantastic cafe that serves uh, brunch and lunch and, and dinner. And then at night they have, uh, often have uh, live jazz mm. uh, and they have this great little outdoor patio as well. So it's a, it's a really fantastic bookstore, um, beautiful place to spend time and you can have a glass of wine and, 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 you know, read, read what you've purchased. So, uh, 
or often stay at night and hear some jazz. And they have two outposts, one in the Roma neighborhood and one in Condessa. Mm. Which one is your favorite one to go to? The the Roma one is, I think, like the flagship. That's like the the most fun. And and Roma's like sort of the gay the gayborhood, so it's got like a young hip hip vibe too at the at jazz nights. And it's a cool it's a cool place. And yeah, I, you know, I actually took my mom there for uh for lunch when 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 we went to visit. Yeah, and I definitely agree that it's best uh, to look into which is the flagship when you're visiting an independent bookstore that has more outposts than one. Because, uh, you know, if you're only getting to visit one, you should try to find the original. Yeah, you, you want to find the one that, that they opened originally. They got them famous before they kind of popped up a, a couple other little ones. The Strands does this, does this too. They'll have, uh, the Strands had like a downtown version of the bookstore. Remember that in Fidei for, for years? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that closed, but um, that's not the one you want to visit. It's just, that's just for like a big room with books. And Ryan, I thought maybe, uh, you know, at, at all, all the famous capitals of the world kind of have their famous bookstore. So like originally I was like, oh, maybe we'll include like Shakespeare and Company in Paris. But then I thought, you know what? These things get coverage in all guidebooks. We don't need to waste our time on that. So maybe we could each choose, you and I have both spent, uh, especially for work, a good portion of time in London. Maybe we could each give our favorite bookstore independent in London. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this will be the only gay bookstore that we talk about, but there was a time, uh, Kiernan, when if you were a, a, gay, a gay novelist or a, a, a gay writer, it was very hard to get your books placed in, in sort of mainstream bookstores. So mm. gay bookstores became a real thing in the, in the 70s and 80s. And- uh, you know, many of them have closed down. We had a, we had an amazing one in New York called Oscar Wilde in the West Village for many many years that closed some years ago. And uh, I know other cities have lost their gay bookstores as well. But London has a thriving uh, gay bookstore that's been there since uh, 1979, uh, hmm. and it's called Gays the Word. And Gaze it is the a word. Gays the word. Yeah. Is that gay? It, is with an apostrophe? Is that what that is? Yeah. Yeah, okay. gay right. is the word, uh -huh. uh, and it's a it's it's an adorable little bookstore that has the most Instagrammable uh, uh, most Instagrammable storefront. Uh, you know that I'll definitely uh, post on the uh, out of office Instagram. Um, but it has a fantastic selection of gay literature and and nonfiction, and it um, it's a it's a real a real meeting space. They still have like the local socialist groups and stuff uh, meet there. If they the 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 queer sort of uh, groups in the eighties that were working to uh, fight against AIDS uh, all met there. So it it's like a, a real space that has been used historically by the gay community in London and still remains sort of a vital uh, community space. So you can get you know your local news, you can pick up a, a, a guides about what's happening around London, and it's it's it got a great vibe. I I loved visiting. Um, and mine is uh, it's called Daunt. Books for Travelers, okay? Daunt Books for Travelers, D-A-U-N-T -A 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 in London. And uh, there are a few outposts, but there's one that you absolutely have to go to, which is it's in Marleybone. It's on, uh, which is the name of a neighborhood in London. It's on Marleybone High Street, which is quite a highfalutin street. Very like expensive kind of tea shops and clothing. And the, the this independent bookstore really kind of fits that aesthetic because it is just beautiful. It is an original Edwardian bookstore. And so it has these long, beautiful oak galleries, like balconies inside, beautiful skylights. So it's, it is itself just kind of a beautiful building to look at. Um, and while there are other out, outposts around London, this is really the one that you should get to. And, and as baked into the title, it's kind of like Idlewild in New York. It, it focuses particularly on travel and uh, if you're an American who happens to be visiting in London, you'll be able to get a lot of English language travel books that do not make it kind of over to the United States. So you get a lot of interesting European titles. Um, and again, similar to Idlewild, you'll be able to, to look up destinations that you love and find fiction, poetry, plays, uh, you know, literary output about that place uh, that I think people that go to that, that love our podcast would also really love. So don't bookstores and Marley Daunt, and I, Daunt books and Marley bone. And I've, I've never been to this bookstore, but I, I, I have read about it because it comes up often when you are reading like the world's most beautiful bookstore yes. articles. Yes. That's yeah. right. 
Great. All right, Ryan. Well, listen, I think uh, that that's that's plenty of chat about bookstores. I, I do think, though, uh, our list was far longer than this. We probably should do a sequel, but I like the idea of asking our, our readers to send in their favorite bookstores. Include a sentence about why. I think it's important to, you know, not all independent bookstores are created equal. There are some boring ones out there. We've tried to give you uh, a, a good list here, and uh, I'll just very quickly run through it. In New York, we talked about the Strand, Housing Works Bookstore, Idlewild, and Molasses Books. In Boston, we talked about uh, Porter Square Books, Harvard Bookstore, Brattle Street Books. Then we talked uh, Denver, The Tattered Cover, Portland, Powell, City of Books. And uh, Ryan had a great Mexico City recommendation, Cafe Barreria, El Pendulo. And then finally, we, we summed it up in London, Gaze the Word and Daunt Books. So, uh, y- y- listen, folks, you're going to be well read if you get to that full list. And, uh, you know, we'll look for your emails to outofofficepod at gmail.com for your recommendations. And, of course, Ryan, as always, I'll include links in the show notes. (laughs) And I think that you're going to have plenty to read as you get to the last stop. Oh, brother. (laughs) The last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Kieran, what what is the last stop? It's your favorite segment. It's my favorite segment. It's popularly known as the people segment. It's where you and I take a moment. It's it's a moment. It's a place. It's a space where we get to kind of contemplate, reflect back on the week, and where we share. We each share one, just one, a singular. I ask. I like the editorial eye that we have to bring to this because we can't share everything we've done in that week. We just narrow it down to the one thing that we've done, we've ate, we shopped, maybe we created. The thing that fed the spirit of wanderlust within us, even during the workaday week, because you can't always be traveling, but we on the podcast believe that you should always be thinking about traveling. So Ryan, I have to ask you, do you have a last stop this week? I do, Kiernan. How long do you think it would take you and I if we just drove from New York to Los Angeles just together? You know, I I think that you're a horrible driver. Mm-hmm. And I'm a very good driver, but I like to stop and look at things all along the oh, way. Yeah, yeah. So I would guess it would take us six months to a year and a half. <laughs> so Google says that if we drove straight through without sleeping or stopping for, for the bathroom or gas or any of those things, mm-hmm. it would take us around 41 hours to drive from New York to LA straight through, mm. which would be pretty much impossible to do, right? Yes. But there were three gentlemen uh, last week uh, or... There were three gentlemen last month who actually uh, broke the world record for driving across America. They did it in 27 hours and 25 minutes. Whoa. <laughs> it's insane. Isn't that insane? Yes. They, they, they maintained an average speed on the road of 103 miles per hour. Folks, this is illegal. We do not recommend this. Mm. Um, but this is something called the Cannonball Run, and it's been like a, a sort of a, illegal a race across the country for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and the previous record was... Uh, uh, 28 uh, or 29 hours. And these folks just devastated it at 27 hours, and 25 minutes. And they managed to only stop uh, for fuel and food uh, for a total of 22 and a half minutes. Uh, <laughs> so every other minute uh, they were, they were speeding down the highway at 100 and 103 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> That's uh, just insane. And, and that, I, we shouldn't be encouraging this. No, no. I, well, I don't think that you and I have the power to encourage or discourage folks from doing many things, but um, I'm just saying uh, when I read that, I was like, eh, it'd be fun to drive across the country. And I always think to myself, I never have time. You know what? I have a weekend, mm. you know? <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, Kieran, what, what's, what's your last stop this week? So Ryan, uh, my last stop, I'm afraid is, um, it's going to make you a little upset. Okay. So it's uh, not about wow air, is it? W- it's not about wow, wow air. Um, which by the way, uh, you know, that brother that told me to stop talking about wow air. Yeah. He told me I actually misrepresented his opinion. He's currently drafting a statement that I've said I will read on air. He actually says that he enjoys the wow air segments that we cover, but that, that's another topic for, for, for the next episode. Uh, yeah. Ryan, um, remember how you asked me if I had time when I was in New York to see you? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, when I said no, that was the real answer. I, I had a work dinner, but uh-huh. as I was on the Amtrak down to New York from Boston, I got disinvited from the dinner because they ran out of space. So the restaurant called, they said, you have too many people. And I was, you know, one of the first on the cutting block. I'm not that important. 
Right. And uh, so that meant that I suddenly had a night free to go out to dinner in in New York. And, uh, I, <laughs> and so I texted my friend Charlie, who, <laughs> New York. you know, you're all the way out in Bushwick. I wasn't ready to go all the way out there. So I saw my friend Charlie and we went to a great restaurant in New York. But the restaurant is, itself is not the last stop. It's called mm-hmm. Van Da. V-A-N-D-A. It's apparently going to be uh, uh, featured on a Vice uh, a food show oh. about Vietnamese food in New York. They were actually taping while you we were there. So, uh, you know, it might be that you, you see me on Vice in the background. Um, but what, what I like about this place is they have, uh, they, they specialize in regional foods from around Vietnam. Uh, and a few years ago, Catherine and I went to Vietnam and they particularly have a section that focuses on a, on a city called Hue. H U E. So it actually used to be the the seat of the empire. The emperor's home was there, and now uh, it's called the Purple Forbidden City. You right. can you can now actually tour it all, and it's this huge palace full of shrines, uh, ruins, and then places that have been kept quite up. And uh, it's a beautiful, ancient feeling city. And there is, a, of course, also like a, a, a dark recent past, um, which is one of the the worst uh, battles of the Vietnam War was the Battle of Hue in the city. So it's quite amazing, actually, that the, the Forbidden Purple City still stands. And so I just thought it was really neat that this, this restaurant, Van Da, in New York, um, at, features a uh, special uh, food just from Hue. Uh, that particularly, they have this kind of array of dumplings that, that specialize from there. And so I, I'll, I'll link to both the, the, uh, the, the review that got me to, to Van Da and to uh, some information about the city of Hue, which if you're, if you're going to Vietnam, I would recommend that you make time to stop. I would love to do a Vietnam, a Vietnam trip. It's definitely on my, on my list. Uh, I had a friend who, who rented a moped and spent 30 days just mopeding around Vietnam. Oh my gosh, wow. I mean, yeah. Vietnam, you recall that was one of Anthony Bourdain's favorite places to visit. He used to talk about that all the time. Uh, I totally know. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's so high on my list. And one of the major reasons you go is to eat the delicious food. And I, I will just, I'll close out by just mentioning, uh, I love the title that they give this area of the menu at Van Da, Hue, Ancient Refined Royal. And when you visit, that is exactly how it feels. Ancient Refined and royal actually kind of it sums up uh, me we're talking about uh, something next week that, that matches some of those uh, qualities as well doesn't it uh yeah absolutely ancient refined royal ryan i am doing a country guide one of one of our famous country guides to morocco <laughs> for folks that don't know our country guides are hands down our most popular uh, episodes. People love, I mean, Ryan's deeply jealous that uh, Bhutan still our top performing episode. And let me tell you, I got Mexico a, City right at its heels. I've got, a, <laughs> I've got a you, good feeling about Morocco. Great, great destination. I was actually, it was a destination that I it hadn't been top of my list. It was recommended to me. Oh my gosh. Would I, would I suggest that you put this at the top of your travel list? Well, I cannot wait to, uh, to visit Morocco through your eyes, Kieran. Absolutely. Well, until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. Ryan, what would you name an independent bookstore? If you were founding an independent bookstore, what would you name it? God, I don't know. What would you name yours? I think the bookmark. I really like the bookmark. I love bookmarks. I think bookmarks make great souvenirs. I think the bookmark is a very cute name. Bookmark is a great name. How How about book tote? Tote, uh, because you tote around books. <laughs> no, because then you can carry a book with a tote. Oh, right. No, but then people can't admire it. I don't think you're <laughs> carrying around in a tote. I've never <laughs> seen you put a book in a tote. 